Cannabis, weed, skunk. Call it what you will, for many people, it's a common sight at music festivals, house parties, and frankly, your local town centre. It's the most commonly used illegal drug in Britain, and last year in England and Wales alone, over 2 million people admitted taking it, even though being caught could land you in prison. But all over the world, attitudes to cannabis are changing. These countries have decriminalised the drug, meaning if you're caught with a small amount of weed, you're not going to jail. Some have gone further and legalised it. And if you want to see things changing at pace, look at North America. In the US, 21 states have decriminalised small amounts of cannabis for personal consumption, and eight have gone further, legalising recreational use. But the place that many are watching is Canada, with the country set to legalise the drug next year. So with all this happening around the world, some in the UK are asking, cannabis, time for a change? I'm in Brighton to meet Rob. Hi, hello. How are you doing? He's the chair of the Brighton Cannabis Club and thinks the answer to that question is yes. So basically, we're visiting a venue that will offer a fully medicated meal for, to Brighton Cannabis Club members. And you say fully medicated, that means there's loads of weed in the meal? Yes, it's uh, cannabis infused, so it will get you high if you consume it. So this meal is all about taking lots of cannabis, basically. Yeah. Lots of people today, it's a rainy, drizzly day on the seaside. Lots of people just go to the pub at lunchtime. Why not just have a pint like everyone else? Why does it well, have to be cannabis? For us, we consider cannabis the less harmful alternative to um, basically smoking tobacco or drinking alcohol, and that isn't for everyone. So where exactly are we going? Because we are just wandering the streets a little bit. I can't tell you the exact location. What it is, it's a restaurant in Brighton that will allow you 24 hours in advance to book in a fully medicated menu if you are a Brighton Cannabis Club member. Right. That makes it sound quite dodgy. Unfortunately, that's just due to legality, and that's why it's only available for Brighton Cannabis Club members. So in the kitchen here, a couple of chefs have been hard at work all morning knocking up some food. Just taking a look over there now. It looks pretty impressive, to be honest. And I'll be honest, it's not the kind of food you'd expect in a sort of cafe that you might get in Amsterdam or somewhere like that. It's not brownies and space cake or anything like this. It's pretty high-end food. And I've actually been chatting to the chef who's behind it, and he's worked in some really top restaurants. And before you get the wrong end of the stick, this is not what they're going to be putting in all the food. This green stuff here is actually genuinely a dressing for it. The food is going to be infused with an oil that goes through it, and that's where the cannabis will be. So Rob, what's for starters today? Um, so it'll be corn-fed chicken goujons with black garlic aioli and for the main course we'll be having grilled sea bream fillet with purple afghan and pea arancini. I mean, where in there is the cannabis? Where, where are we finding cannabis in that one? So you'll find it in the pea uh, arancini. The uh, purple afghan will be the strain and we will be pea arancini. strange isn't it because we're sat here and it's quite a civilised event you're all sat around you've got a glass of red wine in front yeah. of you it's a quite a, a relaxed atmosphere but the government would say what you're doing is illegal and it's illegal because of the harm it can do to you and your friends and also wider society why do you think you should be doing this we believe that the information is outdated their reports and uh, basically uh, research is all very outdated and if you take a look at spain portugal canada america they're all coming through with progressive uh, forward-thinking policies that are basically providing more of a positive impact and utilising the cannabis culture for the uh, positive it can do for the local community, for the industry, for medical patients, for recreational users that just want to have a social experience but not be criminalised for it. I mean, it's pretty obvious, you, you represent Brighton Cannabis Club, it's placed yeah. all over your t-shirt. Yeah. How popular is the club? So, so far we have over 400 club members. We've uh, been around for about three, four years now. We have over 40,000 Instagram followers, over 6,000 Facebook likes. And we basically keep growing. And we've had a, a, one of our outdoor events, Green Pride, which has grown year on year. So our first year, we only had 100 people turn up to it. Our second year, 1,000. Our third year, 1,500 and about eight different stalls. And this year, we hit over 3,000 people attending and about 25 different stalls setting up for the, uh, for the day and uh, with uh, basically limited police uh, um, interruption. That might be Rob's experience in Brighton, but I want to get a sense of the national picture from Greg, chair of the UK Cannabis Social Clubs. Generally, we've got a, a, a movement that's built up now. Six years ago, when we started in 2011, we didn't have any clubs in the country. People were just growing their own and consuming their own. And if they got busted, they got busted. Uh, but what we've done now is we, we you know, put out a model, and there are over 100 clubs six years later. 
working towards that model to try and say this is how we can integrate into the rest of society. You know, we are a self-regulated model that has you know, shown over the years to be successful by the growth that we've seen. The meal that you've all been eating today looks pretty fancy, but is it really not the case that it's just five or six guys sitting around the table getting stoned? Uh, well, I wouldn't say we're just sitting around the table getting stoned. Cannabis is just the thing that's brought us together. We are just socialising, um, just in the same way as people go, to, you know, at lunchtime, it's like, oh, let's go and have a beer. Is the idea of this sort of thing, with all this fancy food knocking around and this kind of environment, to try and take people away from the idea of what a cannabis club would be? Because I think a lot of people would think, it's a smoky club in Amsterdam or something like that. Yeah, we're definitely trying to normalise cannabis use and to be open about it is, uh, is really important. It does normalise it and it does gradually change minds in society. We're not asking people to suddenly go, all right, yeah, we accept it now. We're, we're saying, like, listen to what we've got to say. We're not the demon people that you might once thought we were. The thing about spending time with Rob, Greg, the guys down at the meal was what they were doing in that environment feels quite normal in that setting. But what you've got to remember is what they were doing was actually illegal. And frankly, they could have all been arrested for doing just that. But that's the question, isn't it? We're asking, should weed, cannabis, call it what you want, be illegal? The chances of the guys down there getting arrested today were probably quite slim. But had they done that in a country with much stricter drug laws, they probably would be somewhere like Sweden, which despite having a reputation for being a liberal country, has some of the strictest drug laws in Europe, arguably the world. Annika Strandhal is the minister in charge of drug policy. Because, uh, you know, in Sweden we have a, a very broad political support in both the government and the parliament for our zero vision, as we call it in Sweden, a drug-free society. At the heart of Swedish drug policy is this idea that cannabis is a gateway drug. Can you explain why you hold that policy so close. We see, especially among young people, and also a lot of studies show, that an extensive use of cannabis, uh, or regular use of cannabis at an early age, also uh, affect especially young people's brains. <laughs> uh, so that's why it's an important part in our drug policy and the way that we work to prevent the, the start or the gateway that cannabis is for many young people into uh, heavier drugs. Talking to people here in Sweden, there does seem to be a bit of a generational divide in that a lot of the older Swedes that we speak to seem to back the government and the government policy, but a lot of the younger Swedes have a much more liberal attitude when it comes to drugs. Do you see drug policy changing over here? In Sweden, we had quite liberal uh, use of drugs and policies in the 60s and 70s. And we saw an increase of drug use in society as a whole. And of course, the elderly Swedes uh, know that we had this development in Sweden and also what it led to. Uh, we also have quite low levels of young people that use uh, drugs regularly or even occasionally. So in that way, our policies are successful. But we also have challenges, especially when it comes to to uh, the mortality rate if you are a, a more heavy uh, drug user. And this is something that we are working on. Whilst many Swedes I've spoken to agree with the government's strict drug policy, there are plenty that don't. Alexander Bard is a bit of a celebrity here, a former musician and now a judge on Sweden's Got Talent. He's also passionate about changing the law on drugs. Essentially why Sweden was the Saudi Arabia of drugs, which it has been until recently in Europe, was because in Sweden we had this idea that we'd have a government, it could be socialist or conservative, didn't matter, but the government would actually sponsor an aggressive anti-drugs policy. And suddenly Sweden is at least the country in Europe where drug policy and culture surrounding drugs is changing the fastest at the moment. Because because we've come here because people say, oh, it's the strictest country in Europe. But your argument is it might be strict from the politicians and the people putting the, the laws in place. Yeah. But lots of young people are moving away from that and their attitudes are changing. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, yeah. policy in Sweden and, and the aggressive anti-drug stance here is kind of an anomaly in Swedish culture. Sweden is incredibly liberal about sex, for example. So, so the sort of this aggressive conservative stance concerning drugs is kind of an anomaly in Swedish policy. Swedish drug policy has always been about this idea of the gateway drug, and cannabis was seen as this gateway drug. It was, put, yeah. it was the kind of, it's what all your drug policies based around this philosophy. Yeah. And 
lots of people still believe that to be the case. We've spoken to the head of police who's tackling narcotics, we've spoken to the MPs. All these people say that's still the case. Yeah. Why do you think that's different then? What's well, it turned out it was a lie. That's frankly not true. It's not empirically true. That's not how it works. And ironically, some people start with LSD and then they smoke cannabis. If I come back in five years' time, will it be completely different? Will it be a, a legalized liberal system? We have to start differentiating between drugs that are recreational use and are not addictive. They're one category. But then we have the other category, which is incredibly addictive drugs that are destructive for you and make you dysfunctional as a human being. And I don't see that we're going to legalize those drugs in a long time. Rather, we're going to have a much more advanced and civilized debate on how we deal with addiction, per se. And I think Sweden could definitely go at the forefront of that moment. Later that evening, I found two friends in a bar who have very different views on cannabis. So I jumped in for a chat. It's like uh, with alcohol. Uh, I think that it should be as prohibited as uh, with alcohol. I don't, I, I don't see the difference between it. Because your off licence is a government regulator. Yes, aren't they? yes. And that's how you'd like to treat weed. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You can, you can, you can have it. You can have a beer or a glass of wine or anything or the pairing with food and wine or beer, but when it comes to drugs, it's, it's just drugs. You, and you think they should just be banned and that's the easiest yeah. way to deal with it? Yeah, absolutely. But you don't... But is that really like the solution to that? It's a generation question, actually. I think a lot of like the younger ones, they smoke more like... Have you ever smoked a joint? <laughs> yes, I have. But you wouldn't do it in front of her because you yeah, jeopardise yeah. your friendship? No, no, no. I know she loves me anyway. <laughs> The Swedish approach, on paper, isn't a million miles from the laws we have in the UK. But my next stop is somewhere with a completely different approach. 16 years ago, Portugal took the bold step of decriminalising all drugs. And while that doesn't mean they've been legalised, it does mean if you stop with a small amount of anything from cannabis to heroin, you'll be treated as if you've got a medical problem rather than a criminal one. Dr. Joao Gulao is the man who designed the system. We started from a catastrophic uh, position, but we uh, had one of the highest rates of problematic drug use uh, in Europe uh, by the, the late 90s. It was almost impossible to find a, a Portuguese family that had no problems in relation with, with drugs. We decided to uh, try a new approach. Uh, and we are happy. Uh, 15, 16 years later, we can look back uh, and, and say that we have a lot of improvement uh, in the uh, consequences of drug use in Portugal. If you look at the statistics, the UK has some of the highest rates of people admitting that they've used drugs in their lifetime, much higher than here in Portugal. Do you think we've got a lesson to learn from how you're doing it here? We are not trying to sell a model. We are sharing our experience, which was, in my view, and uh, it's assumed it was, uh, it was uh, successful and uh, can be an example for others. One of the ideas the Portuguese government are really keen on is this idea that drug users are treated medically and not criminally. That means teaching people how, in their words, to use drugs more safely. And this place claims to do just that. Ricardo, nice to meet you. Hi. So we have a lot of paraphernalia here. Some are the materials we give. And you've got users here that work with you as well, don't you? So yeah. it's, a, it's a system that's a bit different to normal. You're not m sort of medics on one side and users on the other. You've got users amongst you guys working yes. here. Yes, I think you should talk to Magda. You should meet her. She's an interesting person. She came here as a client. She knows uh, many services as a client. And now she's uh, working for some years also Excellent. in uh, this project. Okay. Hi. Is it Magda? Magda. Yes. Nice to meet you. Do you want to pop round and we'll sit and have a chat over on the sofa where it's a bit more comfortable? So have you got any personal experience of drug use yourself? Yes, I, I've been using drugs since I was 12. I started doing Ashish and uh, about when I was 16 I tried heroin uh, smoked. But uh, I wasn't aware, there was no information at that time about drugs. And I had the idea that only injecting would get me hooked on airing. From the sound of what you're saying, you've lived through both drug systems. You've lived through the kind of criminalised previous system and this more decriminalised medical system now. How is it different and which do you prefer? The difference is that uh, 
before the decriminalization, we were seen as dangerous people. And after decriminalization, there were much more places where people could get treatment. Well, chatting to people in Lisbon, it's clear that most people seem to think that the government here has got it just about right when it comes to their more liberal kind of medical approach to drugs. But as with these things, not everyone agrees. We're heading just outside of the city now to meet a guy who runs his own drug clinic. And the interesting thing about him is, from what we've heard, he thinks it's all gone that little bit too far. Hi, Carlos. Hello. Nice Hi. to meet you. How are you How doing? Are you? Yeah, good. Carlos Fugas has been working to help users for over 30 years and now runs this residential rehab centre for recovering addicts. What is it about the Portuguese system that you think has just overstep the mark? We need uh, more restrictive um, measures because it's uh, too easy for our youngsters to get uh, drugs. As we've walked around, we've seen clearly people dealing in the streets in certain areas, and that's because, in your mind, they're allowed to carry quite a lot of drugs on them, so it's quite an easy cover. You can just walk around and say, oh, this is for me. That's the main pl problem we have. And, uh, uh, but I must clarify that I'm in favour of, of decriminalisation. I'm not against the system. Yeah. I think the real problem is uh, the business that is behind all this movement. Clients, they just want to have a good time when they start consuming drugs. But afterwards, that good time becomes a nightmare. And when it becomes a nightmare, where goes the rose picture of liberalization? That one can do whatever he wants. People are slaves from the substances. 23-year-old Andrea showed me around the center. He's been living here for six months. I'm keen to find out more about his drug problems. Uh, at the first, I have problems with hashish, uh, cannabis. They were the first. Then I started to go to the parties trans parties and I start to take on amphetamines and later when I was 16, 17 I start to take cocaine and that was very bad for me. I destroyed my life with that. Quite a common path that people mention isn't it? People, it's controversial, people don't agree but this, this idea of a gateway so you start smoking cannabis then you yeah. go on to other drugs. Mm -hmm. Do you see a link between your cannabis use and your later use in other drugs? Yes, because we get used to the drugs and then they seem to stop working and we need something harder. How have drugs, and specifically cannabis and the psychedelic drugs that you take, and affected your mental health? Have you suffered with mental health issues yes. because of drugs? Cannabis, have uh, THC and psychotropics that um, it really busts your head. I start to have a psychotic surge. And I end in the hospital because I hear voices in my head and that was very bad. When I walk in the street, I have always the feeling that someone is stalking me and I need to hide and run. But then here, I start to take the right uh, pills, the right medication to heal myself and it's working and I'm grateful to that. Day two in Portugal and I've been invited out with a street team. As all drugs are decriminalised, they deal with some users who have serious addictions. This man was the only person we met who agreed to be on camera, but most of the users we spoke to said cannabis was the first drug they tried. Standing in a wasteland on the outskirts of Lisbon, surrounded by needles and crack pipes, it's a sobering reminder that Portugal's drug problem is far from fixed. It's our third day here in Lisbon, and one of the things that's really struck me since I've been here is the levels of open drug use here in the city centre. Also, the other thing that's perhaps even more shocking is the levels of open drug dealing that's happening. I mean, this street, for example, we were here yesterday with a drugs team. They said to us, Look, put your cameras away, stop filming, because lots of the people we work with here will be, will be put off and be worried about their, their dealers seeing you in action. So we've come back today with a bit more discreet kit. Just to give you a sense of where we are in the city and how this isn't a run-down bit of town, this is actually one of the main tourist areas. And just over there, 
Well, that's where one of the biggest squares that everyone comes to when they visit Lisbon. The final stop for me in Portugal is the Dissuasion Court. I think it must be this one, so this is definitely the address we've been given. Oh, well, the black is in, so that's a good sign. This is certainly not what you expect at a court back in Britain, but maybe we've got the wrong end of the state. Maybe this isn't a traditional court. I must admit, it get, it's getting weirder. It's definitely not the entrance to a court you would be accustomed to back home. Users who are caught with small amounts of drugs are referred here and dealt with as medical patients and not criminals. Hi, Jim. Nice to meet you, Jim. Nice. Show us around. Yeah, this is the waiting room. Uh, these are the rooms where we have the uh, preliminary interview. Um, before the hearing stage. Um, this is room where we are having an hearing now. We'll be able to join them. Ricardo has been given an appointment after being caught with cannabis at a music festival. He's agreed to let us film his hearing if we don't show his face. I heard the word hashish mentioned there. He was caught with some cannabis, and Yeah, he was caught with a small amount of uh, hashish, a cannabis derivative because it's a, a, a non-addict, a recreational user, first time offense, we suspend the procedure for three months. And if he's not caught a second time in that period uh, of three months, we will close the procedure. After the hearing, I'm keen to have a chat with Ricardo to see what he thinks of the dissuasion court. We won't film you first. Do you think this process, so chatting to a psychologist, a doctor, yes. coming in here, has made you think about your drug use. Exactly, yeah. I'm not addicted, so I will stop. From now, it will make me stop. I don't need it. And the, the systems in the Portugal, I think this is the best, because it's not for one mistake that the person has to be uh, for, for life senses. Well, that was fascinating and quite an experience. From everything about this is weird, isn't it? Look, the building, not a court in the sense that you'd know back home. The whole experience was very relaxed, it was very informal, and we saw a guy going through that case and at the end of it saying, look, I'm not gonna smoke weed again. So surely for the people, the authorities here, that's a success of their system. Back in the UK, and is it time for a change here? At the last election, only one major party said it wanted to do things differently. The Lib Dems want to legalise cannabis. Hi there. Hi. Nice to meet you. I went to see their new leader, Vince Cable. The evidence is clear that if you want to uh, stop uh, abuse and damage to young people, you've got to bring the, the trade into the open and out of the hands of the criminal underworld. The government says it bases its policy on research and evidence, and it says it's protecting people from the harms that drug causes. Uh, well, I certainly don't want to promote drug use, uh, and you know there are some forms of drugs that are legal, like cigarettes and alcohol, and they do cause harm, but they're still legal. And you try to minimise the use, and you use taxation and, and regulation to try and limit it. Others are illegal, cannabis being a good example, but there are serious negative side effects from driving it underground. And common sense suggests to me that you should try to regulate and control this market rather than just have a free market anarchy in the underground, which is what happens at the moment. When cannabis plants are being bred and grown, they have a substance called cannabigerol that goes on to form three other substances when the plant grows. Two are really important when it comes to how the user is affected by the drug. THC, that's what gets people high, but at increased levels, it's also the thing blamed for mental health issues. The other substance is CBD. It acts as an antipsychotic and counteracts some of the negative effects of THC. Depending on the genetics of the plant, you can either have a high THC, low CBD strain, or CBD can be the main compound, or you can have something a bit more balanced. There are three main types of cannabis product, and the amount of THC in each of them varies massively. Hash, where CBD is generally higher and THC tends to be low. Herbal cannabis, where THC levels are low, and CBD is usually low or not there at all. And then there's high potency cannabis, often called skunk, which has high levels of THC and almost no CBD, 
It's also the most common type of cannabis being sold, making up around 80 to 90% of the market in the UK. And some argue it's this lack of CBD and high THC in skunk that leads to mental health problems, especially in those with underlying problems. We wanted to put what we'd found in Sweden and Portugal to the government here, but it wouldn't speak to us. In an email, it says it has no plans to legalise cannabis, saying there's clear scientific and medical evidence that it's a harmful drug, which can damage people's mental and physical health. Well, the government wouldn't speak to us in person there, but we are going to meet someone who will, very passionate about this subject. He's a hereditary peer called Lord Munson. He's got a very personal reason for being interested in this subject. Yep, that looks like a suitably grand house for a lord. So, right, just move in here. Jim, really nice, nice to meet, meet you. Beautiful house. He's Thanks invited so me along to talk about his 21-year-old son who had a problem with cannabis. We noticed that there was something it was becoming strange with Rupert about a year ago. Anyway, he was uh, diagnosed with drug-induced psychosis and he was duly sectioned. One day in January, he said to his mother that he was, he, the voices were getting so strong in his head and he was very scared. Anyway, two days later, he went out in the evening and then uh, killed himself. Afterwards, um, I spoke to the doctors. Somebody just said in an offhand way, this is this yet another kind of casualty of skunk. And I said, well, isn't that just sort of skunk? Cannabis must have changed. He said, well, this is not really cannabis. He said that you might have known the greatest respects uh, 40 years ago when you might have been experimenting with the old toke. He said, this is completely different stuff. So I looked it up on the, on the internet. I was actually shocked to discover how strong um, this variant of cannabis is. And as such, um, it's my belief that um, the way to tackle skunk is to legalize the old fashioned cannabis. So it has um, the right balance of THC with CBD and, um, and it has only a sort of a certain level of potency. Lots of people listening to this will find it strange that a drug that you say killed your son, you're now campaigning to legalise. I think that skunk is, it's been labelled as cannabis, but it's not really. It's a Frankenstein variant. Some people will argue that, frankly, your son may have had underlying mental health issues and that's what led to him killing himself, and it wasn't the drug. Well, uh, well, indeed, yes, that has been um, um, put to me. Well, I received a whole lot of letters, people who read about Rupert's death. Can I read you out one of them? Yeah, sure. He said, I'm so sad to read about the loss of your son, Rupert. There's so many parallels with the death of my son. He also had a history of mental illness, in the most part caused by smoking cannabis and skunk. Lord Munson has received a number of letters, all containing stories very similar to Rupert's. Whilst we're going through them, his friend Louisa arrives. Hello, Louisa. How lovely to see you. She's a drug worker in London, and they've been working together on an approach to high-potency cannabis. You work with people that use all different types of drugs, so heroin addicts, crack addicts. How does that compare with someone that's got a skunk problem? This won't be a popular answer, but I would say give me a room full of heroin addicts than skunk addicts. If I take my therapist hat off and I think of my own sons, I remember saying to my older son, I would prefer you to take heroin than to smoke skunk. And he looked at me and went, Mum, you can't say that. He doesn't work, work with the impact. Heroin and crack, it does what it says on the tin. It's physical, it's emotional, it's spiritual, whereas skunk is the, is the psychotic aspect. Somebody has to wake up and say the unsayable, which is that there is going to be generations of kids with severe mental health issues, or in with Nicholas's case, kids dying. And, it's, and it won't be from your normal OD from a heroin overdose, it will be from suicide because they can't deal with the voices and it's the voices which I work with. I just want to get one final thought from you. You say you've had this correspondence with the Prime Minister, you've had letters going backwards and forwards. 
Recently, in the latest government drug strategy, the idea of decriminalisation was mentioned, but very briefly, and in, in short, it was dismissed as not having enough evidence. I think that uh, the Liberal Democrats um, have embraced my argument, and I know that there are many people in the Conservative Party whom beforehand you would never have expected to uh, embrace a counter intuitive initiative such as one I'm suggesting and I think there could be in the next five years I hope a change of heart in the government with at least a green paper I should imagine. Since meeting Lord Munson I spoke to the Prime Minister. Unfortunately we weren't allowed to film the conversation but she told us she stands by her government's new drug strategy which she says is all about helping people recover. Walking around here and it's not hard to find signs of people using cannabis. Everywhere you go in this area of East London, and to be honest, most other places in the UK, you can see it. And even on a weekday morning, you can smell it in the air. We had the same experience in Portugal, which on the face of it has got much more relaxed drug policies. But I keep thinking back to Ricardo, who we saw at the dissuasion court. He was caught with a few joints going into a music festival and had to go through a half hour appointment with a psychiatrist. He had to go through that kind of court case experience. And I think thinking, what would have happened to him if that had happened in the UK? Had he been caught with the same amount of drugs at a festival here? Realistically, I suspect not a lot. So it does beg the question, when it comes to say weed, do we already have one of the more tolerant approaches in Europe?